the from the his talk i'll now welcome uh, dr diema to pre to present his talk and uh, tell us uh, more about the later history of southern eastern electrocana basin karibu asande daktari yeah so good evening good morning or good afternoon wherever you might be i'm very delighted and privileged to share with you some of the work that we are doing the southeastern end of lake Turkana. and i thank dr kinyanjui very kindly for inviting me to, to share this some of our work that we are doing there and uh, at this point in time we are uh, just doing we are still the project is still at inception so there might not be ground shaking results i'm going i'm not going to share this evening any ground shaking results but uh, certainly some foods of thought and uh, possible questions and uh, of course invite you for a conversation on how we can be able to address these questions linking it to the broader broader electrocana basin and uh, just i'll talk very broadly about the broader prehistory of Turkana basin and uh, the later prehistory of Turkana basin again more focusing specifically on the later time frame and then the climatic background again is which we can view or we can study the later prehistory subsistence economies associated with this kind of a prehistory, the later prehistory of Turkana, and why the prehistory of Lake Turkana or southeastern Lake Turkana matters. What are the archaeological studies that we have been able to undertake? What are the findings? And the post research questions and implication of understanding the basin wide interactions between human beings and the environment. And just to give you a broader perspective about the prehistory of Turkana Basin, I would, uh, from the participant list that I can see here, actually, I'll see, I think I'll be preaching, I'll be preaching to the converted if I start talking about Kenya's prehistory. But just a quick uh, statement, just to make sure that you are all aware about the significance of Turkana Basin, which has the longest record of human biological, technological, and cultural evolution. So, and sustained archaeological and paleontological research Relating to this has resulted to many actually findings, one of them being the iconic find Trukana boy, and uh, which I must add, we were privileged today to have the Hungarian president visit, and he was very excited and very engaged about the Trukana boy and kept wondering why we did not have a Hungarian researcher studying prehistory here in Kenya. So that was a, for us a very exciting moment. And you know also that we have had evidence about still from Turkana Basin about the early evidence of bipedalism with the footprints from Illeret showing how ants started doing the upri walking upright. And the inception of technology, it's not news like you all know about the inception technology. And more importantly, and the one that's very close to my heart, is the inception of managed food production or livestock keeping, which is actually has the earliest evidence that we've been found in Turkana. So for uh, for me, I find uh, we find that actually this is very significant finds that makes this basin a very important cultural landscape. So that is the broader perspective about why this Electrocana basin. But coming down specifically among the later prehistory of Electrocana, the about the it's mainly a very small time frame and it's the Holocene climb. And for you to look at it, actually, you have to look at it against the prism of climatic change, whereby we have the Holocene, the early Holocene, which is Saga 11,000 to 8,000 years ago. We have high lake stands and are characterized by undergatherers and fishers, wavy line pottery, and bonapoons. We have the early, the early middle Holocene, 8,000 to 4,500 where well, water is shrinking, highly nomadic foragers, and the early, early herders. And the late middle Holocene, again characterized by similar lake levels as today, increased desertification, full pastoralism that we are characterized this time period. So there's a lot of dynamics when we come out, when we look at the later 
prehistory of Turkana. And I present this map, this uh, map for the Turkana with the different lake levels for the purpose of trying to understand, like to put, to point out that it is important that we look at this in the context of uh, the basin wide. So even if I'll be talking about uh, the southeastern end of Lake Turkana, but I would like you to keep in mind about the significance of linking this to the broader lake level, that is a broader basin, basin scale. So we know that from evidence we have in this movement like around the lead mid Holocene 5,000 to 4,000, there's increased desertification across the continent and there's this highly mobile pastures moving across the landscape. And we have this evidence associated with it in terms of pottery, livestock domestication, and the construction of any monumental architecture, otherwise we call them pillar sites. And then we also have evidence of new material culture coming into the Turkana Basin. And we have the foragers, as I mentioned, and, and, and pastoralists and pastoral site. But for specifically, these sites, I call that the one I'm talking about, keep on replicating across the lake and across the different kind of lake. But what is important is that um, there is the, in the site specifically that we'll now be focusing, again, as I mentioned, keeping in mind the significance of other sites that have been found across the lake then you can see it now you can uh, you can look at this it from that broader perspective environmental context again is which what these kind of changes are making as i mentioned uh, from the beginning that uh, i would like us to look at these changes or we look at this uh, the archaeology of southern whether it is within the broader Turkana basin or within the southeastern end of the lake against a prism of environmental change. What is the environment, how was like, and how does it change? And we know from unpacking the African humid period versus the later desiccation, which saw major climatic environmental changes, lake levels across the uh, lake levels, or, or the, and also the shifting Congo air boundary, and which is resulting in different seasonalities. So all these are happening across a different time frame. So it's therefore important that we look at it from that, that perspective. And even the southern end of Lake Turkana and the sites that are highlighted in red, those are the sections that actually we have been able to survey and document. And again, this picture just shows the lake, but now again is the southern background across the lake, but within the southeastern end of the lake. So. It's particularly this, and we find that this setting of, uh, at the southern end of the lake, when we look at it, again, it's an environmental background, actually, which have been able to be captured, again, as different proxies. We find that it is, um, for me, I, it's significant for two reasons. One is actually the different uh, micro, micro environments that exist within this area. For example, the proximity to the Chalbi, which is right here. I don't know if you can see my casa. It's right there, that's Lake Chalbi. And then that just slightly down south, you see the Suguta Valley. So there's two different water bodies, like water basins that are in the close proximity. And also there is high elevation, like high elevation settings just within this area. And we have the mm, Mount Kulal, just in the proximity. We have the Huri Hills, and, and uh, of course, the moving slightly east, you'll hit the you'll hit the the Masabit Mountain, the Masabit Mountain. So all these in very different microenvironments, and when we'll be discussing now about the different um, adaptations, we look at it from that context where there are different kind of environment that are available. And we know that uh, the electric canal was very high and it even drained into the Nile drainage system. And that has actually been documented over time. And again, this has been captured through different proxies where digital elevation model, high lake stands that you see in different across the lake. So all this actually provides for us a very good opportunity from which we can be able to understand 
the, the, archaeology, the dynamics that are happening uh, within the southern end of the lake. So, and several teams of researchers have been able to show that the rapid declines in electrocana levels starting around 5,300 years ago, and it is used to lake, to lake service, which we should be mindful, however, of the lake drops, which reflect basinal changes in rainfall, local vegetation changes, which may be played a part at a different time frame. So the substantial shifts therefore in lake level during the African humid period. Now specifically, actually, to coming out to the southern end, actually, the, about, during the early Holocene, again, within, I'm talking about within the environmental context, whereby if you look at the prevailing wind uh, direction in the, within the Trukana Basin, if I, they find actually that they, it causes, so, and the shape of the lake, it causes some, there are some upwelling areas there by seven, which are very, been documented to show they are very, unique and very important for fish, for fish breeding. And therefore, they are, it became very attractive during the early Holocene, uh, those sites. And uh, so uh, the, at the southern end here, you see that there's actually one such an area for upwelling. And this actually happens both during the wet season and the dry season and becomes attractive for that. Again, I mentioned in the South and East Electricana, it's just, just to give you an orientation of the site. And as I mentioned about the proximity, the different, the why we should understand it, again, is the different, the broader perspective, the different microenvironment. You have the Marsabit, Mount Kulal, the Huru Hills, the Chalbi Desert, and the Suguta, and the Suguta Valley, which was the Paleolithic in the, in, the, in the past. So all this actually happened, like plays a critical role on happening on the cultural dynamics and human adaptations that are happening just within this, this region, okay, within this region here within the Tukana Basin. So, and uh, of course, from a hunter gatherer point of view, there is a, this retreating shore soil, um, shorelines, disrupted fishing practices and exposed new habitats for herbivores, exchange and herders who were migrating in broad cattle and caprines in southern East Kenya, and then therefore transforming the economic strategies to include mobile herding as an environment substance changed. People created new technologies, social networks, and form of cultural expressions through non-utilitarian goods such as beads, cattle loans that are still in place even as part of the extensive repertoire of social relations among the pastoral communities, even in Trukana today. So as we look at this, the background of Ali Hadi Miraka is initially restricted within the areas that have been studied. Uh, there is a lot of work I've been done, and of course, with my collaboration with colleagues on the west side, and of course, from my previous work has been done on the northern side, but uh, the southern end of the lake has remained as, as a terra, in, terra incognito, that has not been able to be investigated. And we have this, uh, a lot of us, this environment is changing, I told you to keep that in mind. There is this, a lot of investment in social capital and complexity. What does it mean? Why did, in, 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 why were people coming together to build this kind of environment? Is that a reminder of a shared past or as a form of a social unification? What does it mean? And in the southern end of Tukana, we've been able to document a variety on the different um, types of actually of um, these burial canes, or some are just circular, these are, some are huge, and they, they vary in sizes, shapes, and even the nature of stones. Some of them are even very tiny, tiny stones. And if you juxtapop, juxtapose this one, again, it's the well-studied one of Lothakam, which is just the, the photograph up on top, you see, you see actually there are a lot of similarities in terms of how it has been constructed. So what does, does this similarity in architectural design tell us something about the cultural identity or a certain cultural practice? Or is it a question of a different uh, group identity? And does, how does that compare one uh, uh, just within the, the eastern shores, the eastern part of the lake, or, or across the lake now that we compare, we look, we look at it now from a or at a basin 
wide scale how does it compare this kind of a this kind of a of burial camps so it's important therefore that uh, this kind of unlinked another important find that we find in this southern end of the lake is the rock art okay. and it is different diversity in terms of motifs the different styles and techniques that they're able to document and this is and interlinked to the lifestyle of the local people are seen and uh, we as we shall see shortly how it is interlinked to the kind of their day-to-day -day life there are different uh, motifs schematic images more others in more detail that are represented so understanding how people animals ideas they have circulated in this dynamic and economic social frontier requires examining the extent diversity and archaeological record from a wider spatial extent for the archaeological signatures associated with these foragers or herders in the southern eastern paleolithic and so for this survey that we have undertaken, we have been able to make um, some excavations within this area, and which we are able to permit us not only to contextualize the cross lake comparisons, so we can see what is happening. Of course, we can only compare our data with our colleagues in the later place of West Kana colleagues and others that have been done so that we can contextualize the broader landscape and cultural changes occurring within the to kind of basin, so as we can reconstruct the frontier interactions, adaptations, and strategies to climate change, and understanding how early headers were able to, um, early headers and foragers cope to the environmental transformation, will, which will have, and in essence, we are able to clarify the basis of long term pastoral resilience and provide lessons that can be able to apply to modern day pastoralist. So there's a lot of things that we can be able to learn there, especially in terms of uh, understanding the environment, the resi uh, pastoral resilience, and uh, what kind of coping mechanism they were able to use. And we see this under how, how also it's interlinked when I talk how we can also be, what lessons can we borrow that we can be able to learn for that today and this heritage so interlinked we will see that to the lifestyle of the local people are seen from the cattle branding style and motifs that bear very close resemblance to those used for life for livestock branding and therefore provides a very good setting to understand the biocultural heritage of this region and the longer term indigenous history such as cattle branding and the socio-ecological dynamics since the inception of livestock domestication and livelihood still practiced today in this ar arid but resilient landscape. So, however, it's not very, I wish everything was that simple and where there is, a, you can be able to go down and not just see a before and after contrast and you can be able to understand this, but it's not that easy because even if you look at it from lake level changes, this numerous significant shifts. The lake level is not just like dropping at one go. It changes the numerous significant shifts, and the impacts of lake level shifts depend also on biometry of the lake, the shape of the lake, how it's looking like. And there have been several studies that have been able to done, been undertaken to understand that. So it's not actually therefore easy to understand this within that broader context. Again, as I mentioned here um, about the socio-ecological changes within the broader mass of India where we have the Mount Kula, Chalbi Desert within. And if you look at it, that is a total desert, actually like in, in the Chalbi Desert, it's all the lakes, whatever. And then in one hand, this large, big and green mass of mountains so changes like very uh, contrasting ecological settings within this area, just within a very short span, like you are at the shores of the lake, very dry and arid, you go up to Mount Kulal, very different and dynamic. So this diff, the role of these different micro environments, how does it change? How was it in the past? How has it changed through time? And how does it influence the different kind of, of studies that have been done? Again, as I mentioned, these are the sites that I've been able to undertake survey and document the different kind of uh, southern areas that I've been able to, uh, to undertake in the area. And when we compare this with what has been done by our colleagues in the other side, just across the lake. So you can see here that we have come, there's some work that have been done and then they are compared to what 
uh, uh, the work that I've done myself, that's across. So we've been able to document this, uh, photographing excavations and uh, also working with local communities to understand the different the possible locations of this rock art. So there's a lot of things that are actually available within this space within the southern. Right? So, and uh, again, I mentioned that if you look at it now from the letter across now the lake, about the site that I've been able to document just here in the southern eastern southeastern end of the lake, compared to what we've been talking about earlier with, most sites have about one or two individuals, and many of them are also coming from erosional context. So it's very difficult to find out okay, even that material that they can go to have a secure radiocarbon dates from these sites. And therefore, this being in an erosional context, it means therefore that we have very little information about mortuary practices or the context of the mortuary practice about, about this site. So those are some of the things. And again, Mm, total, if you look at it, the one in red, uh, the sites have been done by our colleagues in later prehistory of Stukana. And then we compare with others that have been done elsewhere. We find that the diverse geographic and temporal mortuary context, and therefore there are multiple new radiocarbon dates setting from 10,000 to 4,000 years before present. So there's a lot of uh, uh, dynamics that are in terms of uh, getting reliable dates for these sites. And if you compare with other sites, so in terms of understanding the biocultural heritage of this area, just the problem is actually the context in which these skeletons have been found. And you can see here that some of them is in very uh, wind, uh, very erosional context, wind blown dust. And therefore, even if preserved in some of them, we find a lot of uh, materials that are relating to beads among others, but uh, because of the kind of the deposit, deposition environment, even leaching as a result, it's uh, very difficult to get these materials. We've uh, done several attempts, several, uh, and uh, none of them actually was able to return a good date. And it, nevertheless, we are not uh, given up because there is um, a lot of opportunity to understand the health of ancient fishers and herders. How do, can we understand, uh, for example, uh, issues about the health, how about the ancient health of these people from the osteoporosis, within the traumatic injuries, um, skeletal robosity, how oh, there's a lot of things that they can have, but dental hypo, hypoplasia, how, how, how that happened, what was happening. So there's a lot of things that I can be, we can be able to understand about health, even this, despite the fact that uh, uh, DNA is limited because of the leaching and also the dating, the getting proper radiocarbon dates is still problematic. So why does the archaeology of the later prehistory of Southeastern Turkana matters? Of course, if you look at it, from the broader context, it matters if you look at it from the broader context in terms of the human movement, of um, uh, how to understand human mobility, uh, livestock mobility, and material mobility. And if you look at it from human mobility, we understand how people are able to move, able to move around, and some of the, as, like, the techniques that post potential techniques that we can go to understand can provide that we can learn from there is the movement uh, from strontium analysis of human tooth and animal, so that we can understand how people actually cross basinal going to the Chalpi basin, which is just as I mentioned, the cross in, in the proximity or the Suguta Basin, which is southwards in the proximity. So this over the southeastern end actually provides a very good setting in which we can be able to understand, answer those questions now. So it's in, mm, the next step actually for us that, um, what are the land use patterns of these, others, of these early herders, herders and why did they build this pillar size? Previous theories suggested that immigrant herders brought new mortuary tradition to Lake Turkana. But uh, however, contemporary uh, habitation sites with obsidian from local sources and both livestock suggest early herders of this had intimate knowledge of the local landscape and practice a mixed economy. Building on, so, so for if you look at it from a broader perspective, building on a research for myself and colleagues uh, from 
the later place of Turkana. This, therefore, we are able to understand the diversity of the sites as a, as a defined, different design leading to concentration of stone pillar sites and in indication of different popular cultures, such as fu function of local ecological conditions, different in design, as well as what is meant by different people with dissimilar subsistence practices that had been triggered by a broader dietary cultural shifts across the Eastern Africa. The proximity, as I mentioned before, the such, the, this uh, site to the adjacent basin catchments, which are patchy resource zones, such as the Sukuta Basin and the Palio shores of the Jalbi shores. Therefore, the, uh, it's, provide, it's critical in helping us understand the specific cultural response to climatic change in a wider Turkana basin. And this we can look at also in a movement, a livestock movement, how was it moving? And movement of objects. And in regard to movement of objects, we can look at it from mobility, we can look at actually under the scenario that Yale, Ali had us after during the African Union period, the, uh, the environment is stable, the shores are stable, therefore resources are abundant and predictable, and therefore there's low mobility. Whereas during the mineral Holocene, uh, it's dry and arid, therefore the littering shores, resources are scarce and unpredictable, and, and therefore there is high mobility. The same thing, the sum of this uh, actually triggers a, a lot of a, generalization about how we have very little archaeological evidence of either mobility of fish and agatras during the African humid period and mobility by early pastoralists during after the African humid period had ended. So in this context, we are able actually to look at it in a broader context and understand about the use of we can use a uh, obsidian sourcing to understand how they use uh, Use life for a week, months of multi-generational transfer of knowledge. We can continue now building on the work that's been done by others, such as uh, Mary um, Frank Brown, Mary myself, among others, and they will provide the future comparisons or possible and other possible scenarios to look at pottery. Pottery is a very cultural object that has moved, object that moves across the different cultures, and they will look using. Clay sourcing such as CPMS techniques, we can be able to understand where they are coming from, from different across sites and able to understand where they are across from Lothakam, for example, or they're coming from Lower Zera as these sites. So raw material, we can be able to narrow the chronological gaps between African human period and pastoral sites and provide a better understanding of what we can be able to match my environmental changes and the archeological records within this area, given the importance of the area in regard to, with, the, with the proximity to other microenvironments. And uh, I think Kendra and her colleagues actually to 2019 had argued about the need to understand the microenvironments, whereby as we understand the subsistence changes through and, and response to climatic regimes, we need to understand the role of different microenvironments. How did it play? How did it provide resilience? How did it provide innovations through time? So, so the small scale foragers experience extreme climatic fluctuations and local regional scales. So therefore the strategic flexibility and technological innovations a character by response to increasing food resource and stress. So strategies for resilience to a major and rapid climatic shifts are therefore provide created vulnerabilities to for pro prolonged aridity. And therefore, these archaeological mobi mobility results should be able to uh, inform long-term perspective on climate change, risk, and human and economic and cultural response, and the current environmental changes and lake level shifts and the effects on communities around the Tukana, however, as a pastoralism, as, in which we can be able to look at pastoralism as a resilient, but a very threatened way of life, especially for the people living in the Southern end of Lake Tukana. And yeah, I think with that, I thank different organizations that are able to support this work. And uh, of course, not forgetting the, I had a very good team of uh, Desert Queens who are able to actually do a lot of work for us in like a survey kilometers upon kilometers, which I'm very thankful to work with them. I thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Diema, for the, your, that interesting talk, quite, quite insightful. I'm sure we have a few people who maybe have some questions. And uh, maybe you can, you can uh, put them on chat or you can raise your hand, I can see, and then you, we give you a forum to ask your question. Any comments or question? I think Rob's raising his hand, Rob. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Will. And uh, yeah, I've gone a bit dark. <laughs> really lovely, lovely talk, uh, Manuel. It's great to see see the uh, the environment around Takana again. And uh, yeah, amazing the insights that come out. I mean, as you know, it's, today is I guess quite a contested place with the, with the different ethnic groups. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, do you see signs of? Yeah, yeah. Uh, conflict, but certainly signs of division of resources. I know today there's quite a lot of tension between, say, the Samburu and the Rendili and you know, Baranas. Do you see divisions of, of areas in the past from the from the archaeology? Thank you, Rob. Actually, uh, it's been difficult to point out the uh, divisions of uh, our contested landscape in the past. But uh, maybe if you look at it from the broader perspective of the work that uh, Matala and our group are showing uh, when they reported about the uh, collateral violence within the, but that's on the West side. But uh, you raised a very important question with regard to the present day landscape. You know, now there's a lot of changes in terms of resource exploitation and use. There's a lot of pressure in, uh, in wind, energy, petroleum, among others that are giving pressure in the work and therefore impacting on the way in a manner in which modern pastoralists are using the landscape. So these kind of challenges and the pressures that are coming through the uh, present day actually affect in which they're using landscapes, uh, pastoralists use the landscape, their resilience, and therefore the way forward. So it's very dynamic landscape that's happening now. So that's why it's important to have this longer term knowledge about pastoralist land use patterns and their resilience to be able to, be, to understand and come up with the policies that can be able to inform uh, this, uh, even as we demarcate lands for conservation, for explore, uh, exploration of energy, and uh, petroleum, among others. So it's important that we, uh, we have this longer term knowledge. And uh, you know, the southern end of the lake is just in the proximity of the largest wind farm in Africa. So it's just uh, within the proximity of some of the sites that we documented are actually inside the wind farm. So I like the aspect you raised about the contested landscape today. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Manuel. I see you've got lots of uh, questions in the chat, so I shall leave you to explore some of those. Yeah. Okay. I see you guys are really complimenting that. Uh, Tina, Gemma, uh, Nikrote, Melissa, Mariam, they're all saying great presentation and it was quite interesting. And uh, any other questions? I've got a question. I did put it there in the chat, but yeah, thank you very much for the for the talk. It was very interesting to see the the rock art uh, in particular, uh, and I wondered, like, it's it's something I don't know anything about, uh, but I wondered if it's possible to extract uh, information about how uh, ecosystems or animals within the landscape change through time directly from the rock art in this region. Are the are the are the sequences complete enough to use this to get a picture of past environments at different times? Yeah, thank you for that question. Mm, yeah, uh, there is a possibility to be able to understand the different, uh, the past uh, landscape, ecological landscape, because of the animals that are there. One of them is, a, for example, there's a place just not very far from the site I report, whereby we have a lot of images of giraffes, elephants, and even some of the signs we recorded, actually giraffes and elephants, among others. 
But today there are no giraffes there. There are no elephants. There are no so there is that uh, kind of a uh, animal cuisine that we see different. We even I think there is one that we recorded something that looked like a rhino among us. So there is this different uh, animal that different uh, portray a very rich ecological niche, uh, uh, but. Uh, in terms of resolving it to specific uh, to specifics and seeing how it changes is still problematic unless we are able to link the archaeological record and the rock art. And that's what actually uh, that is the basis of our analysis. One of the most important things for our research in Southern End is to understand the ecological need, how the if there is a different there is a connection between the archaeology. Mm -hmm. and the rock art and then we excavate in the very proximity of this site see what kind of evidence what kind of can we get yeah can you so that's super interesting so can you get do you can you date the rock out is it possible to use osl or something like that can you can you get actual dates on the age of the art i mean is that unfortunately this is just this is only very few mm -hmm. uh, rock art that have been done with pigments yeah. Most of these art that I, we report here are actually engravings. They're actually engraved in rock. Yeah. So uh, it's very difficult to know what kind of material evidence we can be able to pull from there. Yeah. And do you think, thinking back, you said there were giraffes and potentially rhinos and stuff in those things. Do you think the loss of those animals from those areas was due to um, hunting? Or do you think it's just due to ecosystem shifts, maybe uh, due to due to climatic change? Is there any, is there anything known about that? Okay, with regard to recent historical historical knowledge among the, the broader uh, Turkana Basin, they've talked about the uh, yeah people killing the giraffes because of handing handing for the skin because it makes a very good water bag and like a bag for carrying water but uh, i think we have ecologists in the in the room they can be able to tell us whether they, whether it's just like a as the environment changed also the wildlife were able to change and i don't know for sure i don't know the answer yeah and yeah i don't, I don't know either <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Will. Uh, any, can you see any other hand up? Brian, you wanted to say something? I see you've called Emmanuel, or what did you say? Oh, you said, oh, thanks, Emmanuel. Okay, I see. Okay, as we wait to see who else, who else want to answer a question, I just want to mention something about this is one of the seminars that we are uh, mapping ancient Africa project is uh, uh, the, the, the organizing is a series of seminars uh, coming from different parts of the world. We have um, the Eastern African hub, we have South African hub, we have European hub and we have uh, American hub where uh, a team led by w William uh, is working on a project to, to bring together and trying to map ancient Africa in terms of climate, vegetation, and humans, and how all these interactions relate to one another. And uh, mainly we are focusing uh, the last 4 million years uh, coming to the present. So today we have been privileged to hear uh, that those interactions uh, in during the Holocene in a part of uh, East Africa, which uh, most of these uh, uh, data sets, they kind of complement one another, or they kind of relate to, to each other in different regions. So that, that that's uh, one background I uh, not mentioned because most of us were not yet here to, to know. So, and you're welcome, look out for this space because we'll be having and organizing more seminars from different uh, themes as climate, vegetation, and humans. Rob. Yeah, so, so it was just another question actually, Emmanuel. I mean, obviously Takana and uh, the Takana Basin had this great you know, wealth of finds, some amazing um, grave goods and, uh, you know, great pottery and fish hooks. Do you feel as though those artifacts are representing sort of 
a migration of technology or do you feel as though it's been created within the Takana Basin? And can you trace sort of, you know, longer trade networks as such? Or do you feel as though it's much more sort of in situ evolution of these you know, transitions to food production and, uh, you know, cattle keeping? Sure, we still have Emmanuel. I think Emmanuel yeah. might have. Maybe he's gone. Oh, sorry, the question was for me or for? Yes, sorry, it was a bit of a rambling question. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah that was, was for just, you, man. <laughs> just whether you think you kindly, know, if you can yeah, repeat, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't get the end of the question here. Yeah, so it was whether you think the artifacts represent trade. So they've migrated into the, into the area or they've been developed in situ. So these transitions to food production is within the Takana Basin or it's come into, it's moved into, it's migrated in, into the basin? I think like, uh, okay, uh, I'm, too, I'm, very, I'm very lucky. I see my colleague Kate Creeley saying she can chime in on that. So Kate, oh, please uh, <laughs> go ahead. Sure. Hi, and I'm sorry I can't turn my video on on the computer that I'm sitting at right now. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question, and the answer is, of course, that it seems really complicated. In terms of the lithics and the ceramics, for example, so my colleague Steve Goldstein studies the lithics. Um, I work on a lot of the pottery, and it does seem completely technologically different from what came before um, in the Turkana Basin, suggesting, you know, maybe some kind of migration or maybe um, just, you know, invention of new uh, ceramic and lithic production techniques. Um, however, you know, if you look at the bioarchaeology, which my colleague, um, Dr. Ebes Sawchuk has done, um, it does, we're not talking about complete population replacement or anything like that in terms of, you know, hunter gatherers to um, a new pastoralist population. So it seems uh, uh, that socially it must have been very complex. Um, and we're still working on trying to figure out ways to understand um, relationships between the foragers that, you know, we, we know we're in this area and uh, somebody who came in, you know, with the livestock uh, who didn't herd themselves. Uh, so that's, um, these are all questions to be further investigated, I'd say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. yeah, I see a question from Mariam. She says, uh, I have a silly question to ask. If we take pot's theory of cli uh, climate variability and how that could have impact human activities, is there a possibility to link this theory to those sites in Trukana Basin? How what would have in, in impacted them? My, sorry, my audio is not very good. Okay, uh, it's the, about the pottery. Uh, it's how pottery is connected with climate variability. Hmm. Yeah, okay, we have Kate Krilo, an expert in pottery, but uh, maybe uh, what I can just say <laughs> is that we can be able to see, like, for example, we know there is a significant variability in terms of um, motifs and uh, decorative motifs and uh, vessel shapes for the ceramic vessels that have been found in the, during the early Holocene and the mid Holocene, and those represent two different climatic regimes. What we are not sure is whether they represent a, a different cultural group or you see the shift in technology as a result of a change in environment. Maybe Kate, you want to add something? Hi, um, I'm so sorry that I, I think I missed the beginning part of the question. Um, and I wonder if, if Marianne wasn't asking about Rick Potts's theory um, about climate variability. Yes, that's I, right. I think that's you've answered. Yeah, I think you've answered yes. in terms of the ceramics, but yeah, in terms of understanding relationships between human activities in the Turkana Basin and climatic variability, um, I know this has been really well studied for much earlier time periods, um, and you know we're excited to try to figure out relationships between these lake level drops and what um, humans were doing in the basin at this time. 
um, obviously the um, the the isotope records and environmental reconstructions are going to be really helpful as we try to figure out what exactly you know people were doing in response to um, climatic variability and how you know and, and and what the environments look like and how they were changing on the ground um, is uh, these are the big re research questions driving us forward I'd say. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. So actually, you're right. That was my question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so like, what is interesting me about this theory is that I have this feeling like uh, when a certain climatic event like has to take place, it causes humans to switch activities. So like, if it is probably there is a certain activity that was being carried on when it is dry. So, and when like wet climate appears, then people have to switch from what they were doing when it was dry to like, to adapt to a new, like a wet season, right? So uh, I was wondering if there is a possibility, maybe like what Dr. Ndiyama was talking about, about the changes in pottery, mm -hmm. maybe that could relate to like changes in climate. It could be like the same, same, same people, same, same cultural group, but they have to sure. change their style maybe because of climatic events or like something had happened, probably. Yeah, no, this is a really interesting question and re a really interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, it's hard to tell in some ways what changes are being driven by economic necessity and what changes are being driven by you know, cultural choices and cultural preferences that people um, are making. So yeah, I, I agree that this is something we need to keep trying to figure out. I don't think with the pottery, we can say necessarily that people invented new techniques just because the climate was changing, but it's certainly, you know, an interesting hypothesis to put forward and see if we can test in the future. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Lisa, yeah. I want to say something uh, to add on something. Lisa, Karibu. Yeah, I don't seem able to turn my picture on, so sorry for that. Um, and also, I just jumped in in the last 10 minutes, so forgive me if I say something that's already been <laughs> said. But I think I, I think um, Mariam's question is very interesting, and it's also a question of scale, both in the temporal scales and the, the geographic scales. And of course, it's been very well recognized, this huge climate shift from the African humid period to the, you know, to the post-AHP world. And that's very important. The other thing, when you start sort of drilling down on scales, ge both geographically and temporally, is you start to see that even during the African humid period, there were a lot of fluctuations in, and maybe fluctuations in fallen environments too, although that's not yet as clear. But the lake level people, people like Annette Junginger and others, are really starting to show us that there were a lot of fluctuations during the African humid period that would have been challenging. And then of course, the big change from the African humid period to this drier time when the lake is receding, we have to think about how those changes were playing out on the local level of the human populations and the local environments they were dealing with. So there may have been parts of the big change that weren't so terrible. And then there may have been specific thresholds they hit at, at very certain times that were really diff difficult and catastrophic. So I think the great challenge in front of us as archeologists is try, trying to compare things at a more granular level so we can really understand what the, not just the big picture, okay, climate changed, but how did it change here? And when did that reach an uncomfortable threshold for people? And how would people have adapted to that in the specific environment? So it's, it's, it's a big question. And then when you try to break it down, it's a very granular question too, that's gonna to take a lot of data. So we've all got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. 
Oh, uh, and Will is, is uh, announcing for anyone who is not on the Mapping Ancient Africa Slack page and wants to join to keep up with events, please email him or and also you, uh, you, he, he can send you an invite. And he has sent a link to keep, uh, to, to see the updates of the, of the project uh, on the chat. Yeah, thank you, Rahab. Yeah, if anyone wants to, to is not on the Slack page and wants to, to, to join, then, then just drop me an email and I call Rahab an email and she can send you an invite as well. Um, so um, yeah, a big part of this project is to build the community. So yeah, it's, it's open to, um, to people. So use this opportunity to, to talk to people and introduce yourself. Mm. Uh, so that's great. Uh, there's another question uh, from Alfred. He first he thanks the speaker for the brilliant results and he would like to know if there is any possibility to extend this kind of research to other parts of Africa, such as West Africa. He's curious, for instance, to know how the West African context has evolved comparatively to East Africa, comparing with East Africa region. Yeah, I would just say that, yes, of course, there's room to extend the research and do comparative research and the platform such as this consortium for mapping ancient Africa provides a very good opportunity to, bu to build those collaborations that will eventually lead to a broader perspective that uh, we can look at the, uh, our studies from a broader perspective. As you notice from my talk, I kept making a very reference back and forth to looking, even if I'm studying the southern end or southeastern end of Lake Trukana, I talk, I made a lot of reference to the broader Trukana basin. And therefore, maybe this could provide an opportunity to look at it from the Eastern Africa, to build from East Africa now to West Africa. So the, yes, there's a possibility to put on this, a forum or this consortium provides a very good opportunity for that kind of research. Hopefully when we shall overcome the pandemic. Yeah. Yes, and also Alfred, you can join uh, uh, the, the Slack. Uh, you can send your email and then you, you'll be part of the community and then you see how these things are going on. And we can uh, of course see the gaps that are there and how we can collaborate. Thank you, Rahab. Uh, may I uh, respectfully request that I, I need to jump off so because I still have to make a long commute back home and I have to be here tomorrow by 5 a.m. So, okay. I have to leave so, the office now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope thank everyone, you everyone, if anybody uh, has a question or anything, you can do a follow up uh, email and stay in touch. For, for any other question or any clarification. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Will, Rob, and everyone else out there for making time. I know some of you, you are really struggling with the time, but thank you so much.